Hi, Hi guys. guys. My name is Debbie. And I'm Paul, pastor of the Haven Church in New Jersey. We're so glad you're here. At the Haven, we believe that we exist to create a safe haven for people to experience Jesus. Now our team has put together these videos, the planning, the production for one purpose, to meet you where you are, to help you on your spiritual journey, to bring encouragement and strength and, and maybe just inspire you to keep your eyes on the Lord as you walk through the challenges of your life. Now, these are meant to be supplemental to your personal relationship with God day by day, but of course it's very important that you join a church, a local church, according to scripture. If you live in the New Jersey area and would like to be part of the Haven Church, be sure to check the links below so that we can connect with you. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon so that you never miss a weekly video of worship and encouragement. Once again, we are so glad you're here. Enjoy. Enjoy. Hey guys, it is great to be back. It is great to have you with us. My name is Paul. I'm pastor of the Haven Church, and we just look forward to the next few minutes together just to hear God's voice and just to grow a little closer to Him. Uh, just really appreciate you being part of this. Wherever you are, enjoy these next few moments together. And where we are here at the Union Firehouse, I've got my live studio audience. What's up, guys? Come on. Come on. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, uh, good group in the house tonight. So I'm going to do another installment to start things off tonight in what we call news you can use. Every now and then as I scour the different headlines, I find some things and I see, you know what? My church could use this information. I came across something, and even though I'm, I'm really not good in the kitchen, I mean, I can clean up the kitchen, but I can't, I can't cook. It's just not one of my gifts. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've asked Debbie before, are, are fried eggs supposed to be crunchy? You know, and she just says, give me that. Forget it. Give me that. So it's just not my gift. But I, I saw this headline, and it caught my eye, and the headline said this, what not to microwave. And the subheadline was, keep yourself safe by keeping these items out of your appliance. Well, the microwave is my very favorite appliance. Uh, Debbie's a great cook, and I love leftovers, so I, I'm in the microwave all the time, and I'm thinking, wait, maybe I'm not using it correctly. Maybe there's some things I'm doing wrong, and certainly I want to be safe. So I, I, I found a few things I just want to pass on that according to this article, you should not put in the microwave. You should not put pizza in the microwave. Now, I hope you guys don't do that. I hope you don't. But obviously, some people must. Yeah, you put it in the microwave, it's going to be all squishy and rubbery. It's awful, right? It's gross. The other thing, another thing they say you shouldn't put in the microwave is broccoli. Now, they say when you put it in the microwave, it takes out the antioxidants, so it becomes less healthy. And I've always believed that you should not put broccoli in the microwave. You should only put it in one place, in the trash. Right, right, right next to the lima beans. Right next to the lima beans. That's where it goes. <laughs> And there's one more. All right, news you can use. What you should not put in the microwave. Grapes. You're not supposed... Do you guys put grapes in the microwave? Somebody must, because it made this survey, and I'm looking at it, and here's what the article said. True, I'm not making this up. So researchers found that microwave grapes produce plasma, creating a brief, fiery explosion. And I, of course, say, tell me more. Right? I got to... I got to hear about this. That was awesome. So, so I decide, okay, you know, um, I call upstairs, Deb, do we have any grapes? She yells down, they're in the fruit bin. I'm like, the what? <laughs> we have a fruit bin? Who knew? So I go to the fridge. Sure enough, there on the bottom, there is a bin filled with fruit. Never been in there before. So I grab... <laughs> I grabbed this bunch of grapes. Oh, wow. Yes. Debbie comes down and I'm holding a bunch of grapes and she goes, are you going to start eating healthy? I was like, no, Deb, listen, I read this article and if you put these grapes in the microwave, they explode. She says, what are you, 12? What's your point? She grabs those grapes. She says, listen, you give me those grapes. You're putting those in here. Do you know how expensive grapes are? Who's going to clean up that microwave? You give me those grapes right now. So, speaking of microwaves, I have often said to you guys that the Christian life 
is not a microwave experience. You remember hearing me say that before? It's more like a crock pot, isn't it? It's slow, it's simmering, and sometimes God really turns up the heat. That's kind of where I want to go tonight. We're in this series in Joshua, and we're here by the strategic orchestration of Almighty God, not only for our lives, but for this church. We're here at this particular portion of Scripture at this season. And I want to call tonight's message, our time together, God, why? If you have served the Lord for any amount of time, you've said those words. God, why? Why didn't I get that job? I, I, it was perfect for me. I prayed for the job. I, got, I went on the interview. I crushed it, and then I didn't get it. God, why? God, why didn't we get that house? It was in a great neighborhood, great schools. It was perfect. God, why didn't we get that? We're, we're going to face those times. Now, somewhere we have to settle it in our heart. What God said, he spoke through the prophet Isaiah thousands of years ago. He said these words, my ways are not your ways. He said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And he wasn't done. He said, my ways and my thoughts are so high above you, they're as high as the heaven is above the earth, which is infinitely above. You see where that space jet went up to the edge of the atmosphere recently, that wasn't even scratching the surface on how high above our thinking God's thoughts are. Now, he told us that not to demean or to condescend, but to help us understand that he ultimately always knows best. Jesus said in Matthew 11, verse number 6, dealing with some disillusion among his followers, he said these words, Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. What he is saying there in true meaning is blessed or happy or favored by God is anyone who even though they get tripped up, they don't stay down, they don't fall down, and they're not offended by my ways, by the things that I do, by those, by those times when we just can't quite piece it together and nothing seems to make sense. Jesus said, those are the times you'll be blessed if you don't allow what the Almighty does to offend you. I'll say this, that our, our faith in God is truly tested in times of deep disappointment. Amen. You guys have lived through that. And tonight I believe the message is very timely. I believe it's helpful, not only for your pastor, but also for, for each one of us where, where we're walking. Some have been through some very, very trying days lately, and you've cried out. Maybe you were almost ashamed or afraid or fearful to say it out loud, but somewhere you had that question, God, why? Why now? Why me? Why this? I'm going to be transparent tonight, and I'm going to speak, although behind these spotlights, I'm going to try to metaphorically get into the shadows where people are hurting where people are confused tonight, maybe bring a little sense of peace. Where we're at in the study of Joshua. Two weeks ago when Troy spoke, the children of Israel had crossed the Jordan. Big deal, they're in the promised land after the call from Abraham all those hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And then last week, Jose spoke about the memorial stones. Great message. We, we were challenged to remember what God has done. We were challenged to not move past too much, but to, but to pause and to, to give thanks to God for what he has done. And, and, and now, in, in, in the journey of Israel and Joshua, they begin to occupy this promised land. How many know that even when you get to the promised land, there's work to do? Oh, yes. So the first city, I won't get into the detail for the sake of time and focus of this message, but the first city is a walled city called Jericho, and Israel marches around it. You can read it yourself in Joshua chapter 6, and they blow the horns, and they shout praise, and the walls fall down, and Jericho is conquered. And Israel looks at the next city. It's a city called Ai. And they, they send some scouts out, and they go, you know what? Ai is a piece of cake compared to Jericho. We don't have to send much out at all. Send just a little, you know, little group of fighters, and we'll wipe them out. We got this. We're, we're, we're just mighty, and we're powerful, and we're not even sending the whole army. And that's where I want to pick it up tonight in Joshua chapter 7, because when they go into Ai, 
after having felt a little too self-confident, after having been a little too presumptuous, Joshua chapter 7 deals with the initial account of Ai. And the story talks about a time of disaster, of defeat, and of despair. What happens next is telling. Joshua chapter 7, verse 5. The men of Ai killed about 36 of the Israelite army and ran the rest as they fled. And they killed more on the way down. So the heart of the people became weak and they became like water. You know what that's saying? You ever have those times where your emotions are all over the place and it's almost like you can't gather it in like it's water. There's, it's seeping through everywhere. You're, you're fearful. You're, you're anxious. Your emotions are everywhere. Your heart almost seems to melt. That's what this is a description of. They were so distraught. They were so confused. They were so discouraged that their emotions became as, as uncontrollable as water. The next verse, verse 6 of chapter 7. Joshua and the leaders of Israel tore their clothes, which was a symbol of mourning. And they fell with their faces to the ground. They responded as those who had experienced the death of something dear. Tore their clothes. They, they expressed this, this grief in such an outward demonstrative way by actually rolling in the dirt. And then what Joshua says and cries out in verses 7 and 8, Oh, Lord God, why? God, why? Why did you ever bring this nation over the Jordan? Why'd you part those waters? Why'd you make that sea go back? Why'd you, why'd you do that? only to give us into the hands of the Amorites to be destroyed or into the hands of our, our enemy. If only. Have yeah, you ever been some place where you just talk about the if onlys? Ooh. If only I had done this. If only I hadn't said that. Joshua is saying to God, if only we had been willing to live on the other side of the Jordan. Forget this promised land. Oh, Lord, what can I say? He continues by saying the Canaanites and all the people living in the land will hear of this defeat. They will gather around us and destroy our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? It's, it's I don't know if you've been there, but sometimes when it starts with the question, God, why? And we don't catch it. It's almost like it's a vortex. It kind of sucks us down. Can you hear this in Joshua? Next thing you know, it's like, why did you bring us here? And oh, by the way, we're all going to die. And everything's going to be a disaster and your name is going to be shamed. It just, it becomes out of control. But it starts with those words we can relate to. God, why? I can say that it is not always easy to persevere in faith. It is a discipline. It is a challenge constantly to persevere in faith, especially in those times when we feel the questions, when we feel the doubt, when we feel the anxiety of where God has led us. Now let me open my heart a little bit deeper tonight. And I know there are many that watch and see us from around the country, different places. We're so glad you're here, but I need to talk for a moment, some detail to the Haven family. Because this past week was one of those... God, why weeks? In the depths of the pandemic, God opened the door for us to begin worshiping and producing our, our content, our ministry content in this facility. And it was a blessing on so many levels. And we got in here and we came very cautious and we went very slowly and we didn't commit to long time. We didn't know how it was going to work out. It's a little bit unusual, a little bit funky, but so are we. And what God has done in over a year is this, this ministry has flourished in this place. There are some of you in the room. There are some of you watching, many of you watching. Some that are there at the viewing party on Saturday night. You started coming since we've been in this facility. I mean, God has used it. It's been wonderful. And we've allowed that to not sort of take us on an emotional journey, but to, to, to have us pray as leaders, God, is this going to be our home? We've been, we've been going for almost six years, and we've never had a home. And is this the place? We feel good here, but God, is this your will? And we committed to do what leaders have done throughout Scripture. We said, God... 
We are going to keep moving forward until you close the door. If you don't close the door, we're going to occupy this land and we're going to own this. And so we put in a bid to purchase this property. And we made a contingent on something very crucial. Based on the way this property is zoned, we could do what we've been doing, but we cannot function totally as a church. It's not zoned for a house of worship. So we knew we'd have to have that hurdle, that challenge. And again, with prudence, with due diligence, with care, with caution, got a team together. and We presented our, our case, finally got a chance this past week. And again, our prayer, you know, we, we gathered here last week, and our prayer was, Lord, your will be done. We got our opportunity. And when the dust settled after two hours of presentation, we were denied. And I tell you, there was a moment where I felt trauma. I'm, I'm telling you. I felt such despair. I was shocked. God, really? That, really? This door is closing? God, God, why? I mean, yes, I have faith, and yes, I believe, and yes, I trust you. But in that moment, those weren't my thoughts. My thoughts were, God, why? And what now? And how are we ever, how are we ever going to get over this? And I, I was inconsolable. I was in the office in my house, and I left, walked out, and I couldn't really talk about it. I was processing. I had so much emotion, so many things going on in my mind. I found this dimly lit corner in my living room, and, and, and I just I sat there sort of in the near dark. And, and any of you that have puppies, dogs, probably know what this is like, but my dog sensed something was wrong. She sought me out. She came and curled up on my lap, trying her best to comfort me. But what I needed comfort was so deep, the dog just couldn't quite get there. And I sat there, and I... I felt myself really, really sinking very low. So much dread about starting the process over. So much disappointment. I'm, I'm trying to encourage somebody because I'm standing here tonight, not many hours after that took place. And that's the grace of God. That's the grace I talked about a few weeks ago. That's always more than enough. It's not that I'm a superhero. It's not that I'm on some kind of medication, although I feel like I should be, but I'm not. I'm here because of the power of the Holy Spirit saying, go out and tell them that even in the darkest moment, there is, a, there is a Savior, there is a good shepherd who has promised to restore our soul. Yeah. Amen. Though I walk through the darkest place, though I walk through a place that feels like death, it's the shadow of death that feels like death, I felt like, like Joshua rolling in that dirt when he tore his clothes morning. I felt like a dream had died. But I, I just, I know what he said. He says, I'll walk with you through there and I will restore your soul. And in those moments, in that dark place, and in the hours afterwards, and in the, in the next morning, the light of a new day, I felt like God laid some very practical things on my heart that I just want to call remedies for restoration. The restoring of our soul in those moments of incredible low places. And this is not by any means an exhaustive list. It's just some things that God helped me with in these past few days. And I, I believe if we'll listen, I believe that just like Joshua who had a profound moment that took him so low, I believe that we too can get up and eventually be victorious again. So let me run a few things by you. Give yourself time. To process through the initial shock. Loss of a loved one. Loss of a job. So traumatic. Great failures in life. Things that we counted on. Things that we dreamed of. Things that were right in our grasp. The loss of that can have such an impact. And I'm just telling you on a practical lever, level. We are all wired differently. There's no set amount of time. But give your, be patient with yourself. Because God made us emotional beings. And part of those emotions have to run their course. And even though sometimes it's bitter and sometimes it just, it's just an awful place. But if you allow it to run its course, it is healthy for the mind. It is healthy for the spirit. Give yourself some time. It's okay 
to literally wallow for a while. We don't know how long Joshua rolled in that dirt. We don't know. It could have been hours. We could have been days. We don't know. Give yourself time. Here's what else I want to say. Because I had some urges in those hours and those moments of great despondency. I want to say resist the urge to make any rash decisions in times of deep despair. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. You want to, dude, there were some texts. Randy, there were some texts I wanted to send. There were some emails. I, want, I have my phone in my hand. Oh, I just wanted to be like, oh, you right. I wanted to call it righteous indignation. But it would have been wrong. It wouldn't have been without grace. And it would have not been pleasing to God. Don't make rash or major decisions in those moments of deep despair. Again, connected to that first point. Allow yourself the way God made you. Allow yourself to get healed. Allow yourself to get well. Allow yourself to even have those moments. Yes, the anger, but allow it to work itself through. And then weeks, days, however long it takes, you're thinking more clearly and we can navigate through what's next in, in grace and love and God's favor and blessing. Resist the urge to be rash. Let me give you another one. Invite God into your place of pain. You know what I wanted to do? I wanted to say, no thanks. You led me out here and you hung me out to dry. I wanted to close it off. My first reaction. Being honest. Holy Spirit, gently saying, just, just let me in. I'm, I'm encouraging somebody tonight in a place of deep despair. Don't shut him out. Let him in. I found myself praying something like this. Please, Lord, give me strength and begin to fill my heart again with hope. Hey, I'm standing here tonight. He did that. I'm filled with hope. I've got hope tonight. I'm not, I'm not where I was. And I'm saying it to, to say it's, it's real. It's just, it's just down and dirty. It's what you can do. Invite him in. We, we tend to want to run and hide. We tend to want to suppress. But I say don't do that. Instead, just say, God, I need you now more than ever. You know, it's, it's part of accepting where you're at. Accepting it rather than denying it. Once we accept it, we can begin to deal with it, the realities. I think one of the hardest things is, as humans, sometimes it actually feels good to hold on to disappointment and bitterness. You ever felt that? It actually like has almost like a, 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 a pleasure, a dark pleasure. God, you brought me here. I'm not, how could you do this to me? We tend to, we tend to hold on. God, you, you let me down when I needed you most. I'm on that Zoom screen. Everybody's looking at me. I can't even make the faces I want to make and all the gestures I wanted to make. I'm kidding. A little. You know what that actually is? Listen to me, because I, I went through, I walked through some dark hours like that. That's actually pride. That's ego. That's us saying, okay, God, you're going to be that. You didn't answer it the way I wanted to. Oh, forget the fact that you said your ways are higher than mine and you know more than me. Forget that at this moment. You didn't answer it the way I expected, so you must not love me, and I'm holding on to this discouragement, this disappointment, this anger, this frustration. I'm holding on to it. Here's what helped me, one of the many things in my processes through those hours. I felt like God whispered into my heart at some point in the process, to change my perspective, what do I mean? I began to deal in my mind, my thoughts, with a lot of negative what-ifs. Okay, we can't have this place. What if we can't find another one? What if we can't afford another one? What if nobody comes to the next place? What if nobody likes the next place? What if? The what ifs started rattling round and going through my head. And all the what ifs were disaster. And all the what ifs were negative. And I felt like the Lord say, just change your perspective. Use those same words and say, what if the next place is amazing? Amen. What, what, if the, 
What if the next place, this ministry goes places you can't even imagine? What if I use this church in ways that, that are beyond your comprehension? What if it's better than you can dream? What if? Amen. You let go of that pride and you say, Oh God, your ways are not my ways. And Lord, you said, blessed are those, happy are those, favored by God are those who don't stay down when you offend them, when you disappoint them, when you, you seem to just do something contrary to love. Blessed are those. And I said, I, I, I've just got to pick myself up because I know that however God directs next for this church, for your life, wherever you're at, we have to believe that his ultimate love and care will never abandon us. Will never. Let me give you one more. Some practical remedies for restoration of our soul. Don't walk alone. Please don't walk alone. One of the values of a community is we walk together. I sat in my chair in that dark room. Right after it happened, I said, Lord, I I got to hear your voice. And I'm telling you, my mind was so clouded with crazy thoughts and with just fear and anxiety. I said, Lord, I got to hear your voice. I got to hear something through all this noise. And I, and I, and I was just, it was just me rattling around in my head and I, I couldn't get any clarity. And then my phone that was on the table next to me, it buzzed. Had the, uh, had the silence on. Then it buzzed again, and then it buzzed, and then it buzzed, and then it buzzed. And I was like, I don't have time for this. I don't know what this is. I, somebody's either really in trouble and they're trying me or whatever, and I looked it up, and my phone was filled with messages from you. And through your messages of love and encouragement, I heard God's voice. I heard him through those scriptures of encouragement that you sent. I heard his voice saying to testimonies of how God has used this ministry and he's not done with it yet. When I wasn't able to in any clarity, even as a pastor, God said, because you're not walking alone, because you're part of something bigger than you, I'm going to speak to you through those people who you're connected to. That's a beautiful byproduct of being a part of a church, of a family. Maybe you've not come back yet. Maybe you're still out there and worried, whatever. I understand the concerns, but I'm telling you, you are going to need to be connected because we all walk in places where we got to have each other with us. We all walk in places where we got to hear that verse, that scripture, that word of encouragement, that text saying, I'm praying for you. We need it. It's available. Your small group, your church, it's part of the remedy of restoration. Here's what somebody sent me. I'm just going to read parts of one of them. The church has never been a building, but a group of people. Whether we as the haven had a building or whether we created a church space in another location, God has always been faithful. We've created with his help and made church in living rooms, Boy Scout rooms, an amphitheater, a campground, a warehouse that became a church, a school, a bar, even behind an ice cream parlor. The church is not the building. We will continue to be a church no matter what physical structure we occupy. That's the kind of voice of God I heard from messages of those who I'm connected to, who you're connected to, this wonderful community, this, this body of believers. Don't walk alone. I came across this quote from a pastor I don't know. His name is John Weiss, and he said these words. Too many people suffer alone, and most people who suffer alone aren't looking for answers, but a friend, a friend, who understands. I can tell you through the church. I can tell you through the fellowship. Connected. People will listen. 
people will understand. God will use that as a remedy for restoration. So what now? Well, what now? Last week in this room when we did memorial stones, I put a stone on that pile as many of you did too. And I put a stone of remembrance for how faithful God has been. What now? I trust his faithfulness still. What now? We do our part and leave the details to him. What now? Whatever will get us in his will to continue in his will, that's what we're going to continue to do. Now, in your situation, in your moment of despair, in your place of mourning and loss, wherever you are, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you hear his voice, that you pause long enough to allow him to begin that healing It was a time many years ago when Amanda took a trip to Washington, D.C. She drove down there by herself. She was going to meet a friend in Airbnb. The friend booked the Airbnb, and Amanda calls me. She's like, Dad, I don't like the neighborhood I'm in. Now, again, as a father, I begin to get kind of concerned. Like, I'm, I'm hours away. I can't be with her. But all she wanted to do was have a conversation. She says, I just need to hear your voice. I won't be quite as afraid if I hear my father's voice. You know that Jesus said in one place in Scripture to somebody who was so troubled, he said, don't be afraid, just trust me. Somebody hear the Father's voice tonight. He is very near. You may not see him. Just like Amanda talking to me on the phone. I was not physically there, but there was a presence, and that brought her strength, and that brought her comfort. So the Holy Spirit can do right at this moment. And there's a song. It goes back probably 130 years. It's an old hymn. We sang it when I was a kid growing up. Some of you may know it. Many of you maybe not, depending on how you were raised. But it just lines up with what Jesus said. He said, don't be afraid. Just trust me. And that trust can be a very precarious path at times. But Jesus is there all along. In the valley of the shadow of death, he said, do not fear. For I am with you. If you know this, say, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take. Lord, I ask 
Strengthen your people in their darkest moment. Just as Joshua eventually got up from that dirt and they picked up their swords and they became victorious again, so we will as well with your renewed strength and your power and your grace. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, come on, say amen. Come on. Yes, yes. I love you. We're so glad you chose to spend time with the Haven Church. We would love to stay in touch with you throughout this week. You can visit our website, social media, or YouTube channel. We do our best to post every week so you can be encouraged, see what you missed, and stay in the loop. The Haven is a non-denominational church. This means we are only able to do what we do from your generous financial support. If any e-service, community event, or even YouTube video has blessed you, would you consider making a donation to the Haven Church? That donation and any amount will help us continue to put out e-services, encouraging videos, and be able to reach people in our community. You can give through our website, our app, or contact us, and we'll tell you how. We pray you are able to experience Jesus tonight, that you are able to take a moment to rest and recharge in your mind, and that your heart was able to feel the comfort of Jesus from wherever you are watching. We will see you all soon, and remember, you belong.